person and subject sorry person and subjectivity so first topic here is the problem of subjectivity how why is Poitiwa or John Paul II so concerned with the problem of the person? Now, there's one idea or subject that runs through the, the philosophy or the thoughts of Carol Poitiwa or John Paul II it must be the human person and his dignity. And I already discussed this the source of that dignity of the human person as being an imago Dei. There are many variations that are played in this theme, but this thought progresses, but it always remains beneath or within them as then an enduring subject. So when you read, for example, not just in his philosophy, but even during his papers, it's always the human person that is, I think, very pronounced, very dominant in this subject. It may take several forms, or he may discuss it differently, he may connect it to some other issues, but it always boils down to the human person, the dignity of the human person. And for that, of course, his philosophy is going to be a kind of personalism. But what kind of personalism? Because there are other philosophies which we can regard as personalistic. We can say that the philosophy of Marcel is personalist, or the phenomenology of Scheller is personalism. Even Aquinas could be regarded as first a kind of personalism, or his philosophy kind of personalism. So his encyclicals, addresses, and sermons always touch on the dignity of the person, or the human person per se, and his interest can be explained through his own personal history and the philosophical and societal issues during his time. And there's one thing about the existentialists and phenomenologists. They always refer back to their personal experiences. And like other philosophers, that they will never have any idea of what their philosophical or personal experiences are. Like who knows about the life of Kant? Or the personal experiences of Kant? Or even the personal experiences of even St. Thomas Aquinas? If you're talking about this philosophy. They don't figure very prominently in their philosophies. But there's something about phenomenologists and existentialists because they always have their personal experiences as some kind of a touching point of their philosophy, kind of anchoring. So it, it, they gave me the impression that when they're not just theorizing, they actually base their philosophies, their thoughts on their personal experiences. So it is general knowledge that Vaitiva endured tragic experiences during his life, especially during the early part of his life. And these experiences molded his personality, his thinking, his thoughts. Right? So first he lost his mother at an early age, and then his brother when he was eight, later his father. At the age of 21, he was totally orphaned. And then, of course, he endured the different upheavals that crossed that part of Europe during the 20th century. And Poland will always bear the brunt of all these you know, upheavals. I think it's only now that Poland has uh, enjoyed that, that kind of independence. Um, but before that, they, they were under the uh, two tyrannies. First, they were invaded by the Nazis. And then the Russians came to, you know, to liberate them from the Nazis, only to occupy them. So they were occupied by both the Nazis and the communists. Okay? So those of you who have watched some movies about the life of Oitiwa, these are two very important events during a time that influenced the life of Karol Oitiwa. Uh, he will be actually very active in the in the underground movement. So, but he not only observed, but experienced the horrors of these regimes. Was also victims. Was also a victim. He shares the pains and sufferings first during the Nazi occupation and later during the communist regime in Poland. 
and many of his friends. And this is it's particularly the Jews, because this, it, but he was a young boy, he's a friend of almost everybody, particularly of the Jews. Okay. He has a friend, Andres Kluber, Ruger, uh, wrote a book about, well, it's, it's about the friendship between him and Karol Wojtyla. Huh? Is it about Yeah, Ruger, right there. Yeah, okay. So, they were separated and then uh, the first non-Christian or the first non-Catholic that it's not, it's not really the, the first non-Christian, it's actually the first day to, to have a, a private audience with John Paul II when he was elected as Pope. So he met this, his close friend. No? The first lady to have a private uh, audience with John Paul II when he was elected. All right. So, in these brutal and horrible events, but he was saw how man can be both an agent of goodness and evil. Man is always a fossil to, him, to, to some philosopher. He, he, he can be the source of goodness. He can also be the cause of evil. Okay. He could be the victim and he could be the culprit. Okay. So in the midst of this violence, it's always man who is the victim, but the culprit of that is also man. So both of James manifested the capacity of man to sink to the level of the beast or rise to that of an angel. Now, anti-person ideology. So there are two anti-person ideologies that he encountered during his life, Nazism and Communism. Which were built on a negative, the negative views of man. These ideologies that regard the other human being, the individual who dares not share their religious beliefs or political persuasion, are less human or not human at all. So the basis of that, for you to be respected as a human being, is that you share their religious beliefs or political ideologies. If you don't share with their religious beliefs or political ideologies, you are treated less or treated as not human. Okay? So, those who profess and believe in a different ideology or religion are subjected to inhuman treatment. Okay? So, imagine all these things influencing the thought of the young Carl Wittima. Okay. So in his short autobiography, he remarked how these strong experiences in these two systems influence his deep concern for the dignity of the human person. And here he writes, the two totalitarian systems which tragically marked our century, Nazism on the one hand, marked the horrors of the war and the concentration Comes and communism on the other with regime of oppression and terror. I came to know, so to speak, from within. So it's that, the point of view is that I'm not just talking about communism and, uh, and Nazism as somebody who's looking from the outside and looking from the outside to inside. He somebody is into this system. I mean, he suffered, he experienced this system. Some people can talk about communism objectively from a distance or these horrors from a distance, but never experience it. But he, he experienced it firsthand. He was a victim of these of this regimes. And so it is easy to understand my deep concern for the dignity of every human person and the need to respect human rights, beginning with the right to life. Because if there, if there is a right that's been you know, uh, disrespected during these two regimes would be the right to life. This concern was shaped in the first two years of my priesthood and has grown stronger with time. It is also easy to understand my concern for the family and young people. These concerns are all interwoven. They develop precisely as the result of those tragic experiences. So, 
the, the he he referenced his thoughts, his philosophy with his personal experiences. But of course, historically, after Nazism and communism, these two ideologies will be over. But after this comes another ideology, another ideology that would undermine the dignity of the human person. And here we are referring to the ideologies of consumerism and materialism. Okay. So aside from Nazism and communism, there was the emerging consumerism, a kind of materialism that pervaded the West that must also be addressed. So after, uh, of course, you have the, the end of the, na of the Nazi regime, and then we have the end of communism, well, of course, to referring to Russia. But after that, you have another kind of ism that must be addressed. So the consumer society is focused so much on the quantitative development of man's condition, but paid little attention to the human person himself. So after the onslaught of the two ideologies, here comes another kind of ideology that would, again, degrade the value of the human person. Again, he said, it is a time of great controversy about the human being, controversy about the very meaning of human existence, and thus about the nature and significance of the human being. This is not the first time that Christian philosophy has been faced with materialistic interpretation, but it is the first time that such an interpretation has had so many means at its disposal and has exposed itself in so many currents. This aptly describes the situation in Poland today with respect to the whole political reality that has arisen out of Marxism, out of the electrical materialism, and strives to win minds over to this ideology. So again, we have materialism, but again, the irony is that why materialism wants to uh, overcome some kind of uh, alienation of man, the, 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 the contrary or the other position leads, leads to consumerism. I mean, uh, the, the thing with, with our side is that while we combat one evil, another evil comes out. Okay? So while we combat, for example, alienation, so, for, so first, we start with the feudal system, and then that brings about the rule of the, the ruling class, and then, of course, the ruling class will have to revolt against the ruling class, and then another class emerges. Okay. So, okay. Now, now, of course, we are dealing with a, a different kind of consumerism, a, neo, a neoliberal kind of ideology. So. So, to uplift and promote the dignity of the person, these ideologies with their brutal regimes and emerging consumerist and materialist orientations must be opposed. So, that is the ideologies that we were wanted to address. Okay? So, to oppose such ideologies with their tyrannical regime and this emerging consumerist thought, there must be a philosophy of the human person which regards everyone, regardless of race, political beliefs, or political orientations, religious beliefs, as a human being with dignity. So again, the answer of Saint of Baitiwa or John Paul II to all these ideologies is a kind of philosophy of the human person that respects this. Okay? That respects this. Of course, you can have many different philosophies that you can call personalist. But Vaitiwa's personalism is unique in the sense that that is always the you know, underlying thing, the dignity and value of the human person. Okay? Some, idea, some personalism will tell, you, will tell us about the subjectivity of man, will tell us about the emotions of man. But well, they may touch sometimes on dignity, on value of the human person, but not as 
as pronounced as this. So during space Pussy, Baitiwa, or John Paul II, became more vigilant and focused his energies and his teachings on how to combat these ideologies and orientations. One central piece of his papacy is promotion and protection of the human person and his dignity. So that explains, well, that explains his, you know, his passion for the human person, for the defense of the human person and his dignity. Thus, his treatment of the issue of the human person was not so much on the epistemological aspect as to understand what human person is from a theoretical or a speculative perspective, okay? but more on the ethical, the practical, and the anthropological. So that's how we can differentiate his philosophy, his concern for the human person from other philosophies of the human person. Because his philosophy of the human person is not so much trying to understand what is the person from an epistemological orientation or perspective, but what is the person in terms of the ethical, in terms of the practical, in terms of the anthropological. Okay. So it gives us the, you know, uh, we, we can be more appreciative of his philosophy because we are not just theorizing here about the human person. Okay? Now, let's go to any questions so far. I want to start my discussion with that so that one, I answer one question that is often asked about Waitiwa. Why is so he is so concerned with human person and dignity? What is with the person? What is with human dignity? Especially in philosophy. Hardly you talk about dignity and and the human person in in philosophy, you, you talk about some other abstract, you know, abstract things. Yes. Uh, it is very obvious or very clear that uh, Nazism and communism, they are not taking human beings as as with dignity. How about uh, can you elaborate a little more how consumerism and materialism boundaries? Okay. Well, the answer that, uh, in, in our modern times, the focus is so much on the material aspect of man. Like, well, there's nothing wrong with the body, but when you focus more on the convenience of the physical, of the material, sort of, there is no longer a balance between the physical and the spiritual. Okay? And today, there is, man put so much emphasis on the material. Yeah. That's, the, that's the materialistic interpretation, or the, that's the materialistic orientation. But how do you satisfy this materialistic orientation or tendency? Well, you have to satisfy your materialistic, that, that materialistic tendency with consuming, it promotes this this attitude of consuming, and by consume we mean we consume uh, this the, 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 the material. I mean, the, we buy so much of this. You know? We focus more on the physical. We focus more on the on the material. And the thing is that because of the advancement of technology we can have very convenient, very efficient way of life. And that's the promise of modern life. Okay? But that is premise on consuming more and more and more. Okay? Now, how does that affect the dignity of the human person? Well, it affects everything in the sense that even the human person becomes some kind of a commodity in that consumerist orientation. So instead of recognizing the human person with dignity, well, for example, with, with these consumerist ideas, the, 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 the tendency or the need or say, the greed to consume, you have to produce more. And in order to produce more, then you will need more people doing you know, the work. And sometimes, we go back to, the, to the, our discussion about 
the workers, people being eliminated because of what they do. So it affects the dignity of the person in the same way that well, the Nazis and the, and the communists are brutal in the sense that they are literally killing people. Okay? But it, this is also as brutal because it degrades the dignity of the person. In a consumerist, in a consumerist uh, society, it's the same as, you know, if you, you degrade the human person or the dignity of the person as much. Okay? Yes, yes? With regards to, to the philosophical accounts of Carol Goetheo, particularly the active person, so yeah. can we see that most of his works is a kind of ontology, an ontological interpretation of man, the person, through his action, which man reveals himself? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you can say it's an ontological interpretation of of man through his action. Yes, that's correct. But the point of this, the, the, the point of discussion is why is he so concerned with the person? And later on in the discussion, we'll show that uh, I think I mentioned this last time that for Buti was the solution to the ethical and to the religious and the, and the political and even the, so, the societal problems goes way back to the ontological or to the metaphysical. Okay? Because the, the metaphysical or the ontological tells us about how we view reality. In this case, how we view the reality of the human person. So we need to have, for him, the right ontological or metaphysical foundation of our understanding of the human person. So he used, well of course, he goes back to what the human person is as a subject. So a young person is a subject, and as a subject, his interiority. As a subject, he has his own, has his own spirituality, and that spirituality can be traced back to the fact that he was created in the image and likeness of God. Okay, fine. So, you, you have to develop that kind of ontology or metaphysics, because it sets us to the proper understanding of the human person. And if we have this right understanding of the human person, then, Ethically, culturally, politically, etc., we're going to treat the human person in the proper way. But without the correct interpretation or understanding of the human person as a substance, as a being, a spiritual being, and so on, then we're going to have this problem. So for we one, our ethical, our practical, our social or anthropological or uh, understanding of man reflects the kind of ontological or metaphysical understanding, our ontological or metaphysical understanding of man. So for me, what the, these are connected. Okay? The political, the ethical, the anthropological is connected to the ontological. The ontological defines our ethical consideration or understanding of man. Okay? But of course, in the active person, he has to explain what is this, what is the ontological? Okay, what is the ontological? And we can only see the ontological by the way of what is externally manifested in this sense, his action. So if you want to understand the very ontology of the human person, what he is, then we have we, for him, then the proper way or the proper uh, method or the proper approach is to approach man on the basis of his action. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, previously, you mentioned the historical background of our way was uh, philosophy that would shape his uh, philosophy. Uh, the, the experience of communism or Marxism, the Russian version of Marxism, in his own country in Poland. But Karl also criticized the kind of Marxism that, that is being experienced in Poland. Yeah. Although, in a way, we know that there is this humanistic uh, 
importance in Marxism that he Karl Marx talked about the alienation experienced by the working class, uh, the kind of uh, oppression that the working <coughs> class experienced from the capitalists. And Marxism also became the inspiration of some critical theories. Yes. So my question is, uh, what are the tenets, the Marxist tenets, which can we uh, uh, criticize uh, like the humanism of Karl Marx and the humanism of Karl Marx? OK, first of all, he, he was more, I, I specifically used the, term, the, the communism. He was more critical of communism, especially how the communists ravaged his, his homeland. Okay? And we, we know that there's a difference between Marxism and communism. And there's also a difference between the thoughts of Marx and the Marxist. Okay? And what's the difference? Well, the communism is a practice of Marxism. By practice of Marxism, it's an interpretation and application of the Marxist ideas by the communists. Of course, there was first co communism before Marxism. There was already the Marxist or the Communist League before Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. He actually wrote the Communist Manifesto for the communists. But given the chance to write the Manifesto of the communists, well, since the, the communists are not that intellectuals, that's why they need Marx to and Engels to write the, the, the Communist Manifesto, Marx put in there all his ideas about, about his philosophy. Okay? <coughs> but what is the philosophy of Marx? Well, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the Marxists, but what is practically the philosophy of Marx? It's dialectical materialism. Influenced by the dialectics of Hegel, this is something this is development, okay, you know that. And then materialism coming by way of pure back. Okay? Now, of course, we're going to say that before the uh, before the communist manifesto, there was the manuscript of 18, I forgot the, the, the year, but 1874, 18. <laughs> but that's the original that's the original thought of Karl Marx before communism came to the picture. Okay? But he, Marx in the in, in the in the early part was talking about human, but he was more it is a kind of humanism because it pronounces the the, the, the value of the person, but he said he was, he, was, he was more critical of religion, specifically Christianity. Okay? Because he wanted to, you know, a, a, la, a la Freud, for example, or a la, a la Nietzsche, you have to develop man by not re referencing or referring to some kind of, you know, an afterlife or a being that is beyond us. That's a kind of humanism. It pronounces, or it it uh, it emphasizes the the very faculties, the very capacity of man to stand on his own, to affirm himself, to develop himself, sort of well, uh, what Nietzsche would call the Ubermensch, without referring to a god or a life here after and so on and so forth. So, if there's one thing common between among Marx and, and Nietzsche and Freud is, you know, to 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 affirm this this the natural you know the natural capacity the qualities of man. Now he got that of course he got that from Feuerbach because Feuerbach's idea of Christianity religion but he was actually talking of Christianity is that well God is just the product of man's imagination. We feel so, so low, 
We think we are low, we think we are inferior, we need a uh, security blanket, we need a security net, and therefore we have imagined this being who is powerful, and then we attributed to him all the all the good qualities that we have as a human being. That's a kind of alienation. Now what do we do? We have to take back all those qualities. You know? Uh, affirm our our take back all those good qualities that we we projected to God. Now that's a kind of humanism that is different from the humanism of Aquinas. So if he's critical of of Marx, he is not critical of the fact that Marx elevated or affirmed the dignity of the, of the person. But what kind of humanism was he trying to he is trying to convey? It's a kind of humanism that separates us from our spiritual origin. Okay. But of course, though in, in communism, well, the the Russians, the Bolsheviks, they, they they interpreted, applied the idea of Marx, the communist idea of Marx, not the early Marx, the communist idea of Marx, into into the in, first in Russia and then into the territories that they have conquered. It, it's, a, it's a rather complicated, you know, connection of this, right? But it, there's a way of navigating, of navigating this. So, if if he was critical of some of the Marxists, like for example, he's called the priest and so on and so forth, because they are they are now well, it's a kind of humanism, but it's a different kind of humanism. It's a humanism that breaks us from our spiritual origin. And Precisely what Marx said that if you are a, a, a Marxist, you have to be an atheist because religion does not have a place in dialectical materialism. It's a materialism. And from uh, at, at the base, at the root of materialism, is the denial of anything that is spiritual. So while he may agree in some respect to Marxism, but he will never totally agree with that idea with the kind of humanism that breaks us apart from our spiritual origin. Plus, of course, the fact that the practice of communism in Russia and in Europe cuts all references to individual freedom, which is very valuable to the human person. Of course, for a time, even Tsar was he was also influenced by Marxism. For a time, Marx, or Sartre, John Paul Sartre was a Marxist. Because of, the, because of this kind of humanism. But while Sartre talks about individual freedom, the kind of freedom that is practiced in Russia and somewhere else is different from the kind of freedom that he was envisioning for Marx. All right, other questions? Did I? Yes. Since Marx is brought up in our discussion, um, as a response to this hostile ideologies, is there any similar similarity or disparity between Marx, the proletariat or the class struggle, and what he was was opposi attitude of opposition and participation, a solidarity? Okay. Uh, between the, what's that, the proletariat and so the uh, class struggle. And uh, the anyway, the was opposition and solidarity. Okay. Uh, first, uh, well, you know, when the struggle of the proletariat, of course, Marx said that that would be the dictatorship of the proletariat. But for the Russian, for the Bolshevik, that's impossible unless you form a party of the proletariat. Okay. That's that's where the Bolsheviks come come in. So it's not actually the party of the proletariat if you what book is this of hate of, of Lenin. The first part was it was actually driving the idea that it cannot just be proletariat. Because if, if, if there will be no power within the proletariat that will gather them together, it will not work. So there must be a party of the proletariat. That's where the Bolsheviks came. Alright? So there must be the, the now what's the difference between 
with reference to the to, to, to viewers' idea of uh, opposition and solidarity, he was actually talking to a general type of opposition. Okay? Because, again, he was talking of an opposition that just for the sake of opposing. What defines a, a genuine opposition, this is one of the genuine attitudes of, of participation, is the view of the common good. You oppose because you just don't want to oppose. You oppose because you want to promote the common good. So in a, de in a democracy, there is a general opposition because everybody is looking at the common good. And if I oppose, if I question the position of somebody, I'm not opposing or questioning just for the sake of opposing. I'm questioning or opposing because I'm also working for the common good. Now, can we have that kind of opposition in a communist, in a communist party? It's impossible because there is always the party line. You oppose, you perish. What happened to the to the opponents of? I mean, you would look what happened to the what what did Khrushchev, for example, or or Stalin did to those who oppose his policies? Okay, is that genuine opposition? It's not for the common good. It's good for it's the good of the party, not the common good. And that is the kind of opposition that Goitiwa opposes. He advances the idea of genuine opposition, advancing the common good. And when we have this genuine opposition, then solidarity can come in. Solidarity is not some kind of conformism. And that's one of the negative attitudes of participation, conformism. You see, you know, you just agree and agree and agree, say yes, 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 yes. So everybody say yes, is that some kind of a solidarity? No. There must be a democratic space for genuine opposition. So if you say yes, that means you have clearly examined that that's the right move for the common good. So it's not just to conform. Okay. Okay. Other questions? None, then if none, then we can move on. Yes. Um. Was, would you be know, more concerned on uh, doing a critique or destroying those ideologies? Or was he uh, focusing on, or was he providing solution for the agent that is man who can be an agent of uh, either good or evil? Or is he doing both? He's doing both. He's, he's doing both. He's, he's, he's addressing the issue, the problem, and not just addressing the problem, he was very instrumental in crashing down, putting down all these, the, the, I mean, well, during his papers, but he was very instrumental in the, in the, you know, in the downfall of communism. So he was at the same time addressing that, but at the same time, he was also developing a kind of philosophy that, that will answer this. Okay, so he's doing this, this on several fronts. Okay, uh, in in the arena of you know public in public discussion and then public policy, for example, in you know so for example, the, the first thing that he did during his papers he visited this lady Kathy Pollan, and that visit is very instrumental in you know in uh, generating this you know this energy, this mass energy for change to oppose the. The, the communist regime there. But at the same time in his writing, he was also addressing the, the problems in his, in his writing. So at the same time, he's addressing the problem, but at the same time providing or forming a kind of philosophy that will make us understand what is really the body of the human person. So on one front, he is defending human dignity, human person. At the same time, he is developing a kind of philosophy that will make us understand what the human person is. Now, of course, you want to say, well, in the first, in the first, on the on one side, when he was spoke, he was he was not philosophizing, all right? I mean, he is not just uh, he's using his influence as as a pope to you know to to cause social changes, okay? 
But on the other hand, as a philosopher, he's also developing his own philosophy. Right? Of course, he has, he has the benefit of being of being the Pope. Other philosophers will not have that benefit, will not have that that influence. But if if you're going to see the man, both as a Pope, both and as a philosopher, he has influence, of course, and deniably has, in, has more influence than any other philosopher. Well, maybe Marx could be as influential because he, he, through his through communism, he was able to influence almost half of the world. No, not really half. But you have Russia, you have China, would that be half of the world already? And then you have Eastern Europe, and then you have North Korea, and then Cuba, and then. <laughs> Imagine, is there somebody, a philosopher, who could influence that? That part, that much part of the of the world, see, just by you know influencing Russia and China, that's that's a big part. At least geographically and demographically, All right? No more. So we 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 could move, we continue. So now we are now. So that's the that's the practical aspect. Let's go to the, to the philosophical, okay? How he addressed this problem. So the problem of subjectivity. Voitiva's philosophy of the human person starts with the problem of human subjectivity. By, by problem, it's not just a topic, but there's really a problem with the discussion of the human subjectivity. Uh, what is this problem? So his personalistic philosophy answers a particular problematic philosophical problem rooted not only in the political and socio-economic spheres but in philosophy itself. For Vitiwa, for him, there is a problem in philosophy and that problem is about human subjectivity. Okay? Hence, his philosophy can be situated within the larger context of the problem of human subjectivity and the human condition. What is, what is human subjectivity? Or what is subjectivity itself? That's a philosophical problem. Of course, that is not an anthropological or you could say it's an anthropological problem, but it's not a practical problem. It's not a problem for a, you know, a, a person outside of philosophy. Okay? So, the problem about the condition of the human person is not only caused by political ideologies, as we have mentioned, and social and economic orientations. In the area of philosophy, anthropology, and ethics, there is a more specific problem within the issue of the human person itself, and that is the issue about the subjectivity of the human person. Okay, so, so we are not just talking about human person in, in general, but we are talking now of a more specific aspect of the human person, his subjectivity. And for Vodiva, that is a problem in philosophy. What is human? What is subjectivity? So the problem of subjectivity of the human person lies at the very foundation of human practice, in that philosophy has an important role in the proper understanding of this issue, or the problem of subjectivity. So he said, in addition to the problem of the subjectivity of the human person, particularly in relation to human community, it imposes itself today as one of the central ideological issues that lie at the very basis of human practice, morality, and thus also ethics, culture, civilization, and politics. So you see, for him, you, it's impossible to just talk about human morality, culture, civilization, Polish without touching on the metaphysical or the ontological. So philosophy comes into play here in its essential function. Philosophy is an expression of basic understandings and ultimate justifications. The need for such understandings and justifications always accompanies humankind in its sojourn on earth. But this need becomes especially intense in certain moments of history namely in moments of great crisis and confrontation what he's talking about here 
The need for such justification and understanding always accompanies humankind in its sojourn on earth. Because it was referring here, in the history of mankind, there's always that question about basic understanding of certain things. How do we understand the human person? Or during the medieval, how do we understand God? Or during the modern era, how do we understand reason? How do we understand knowledge? There's always, you no. Know, uh, this understanding always accompanies humankind. But it becomes more intense, the question about these things becomes more intense in certain moments of history, in moments of great crisis and confrontation. Meaning, if thinkers, philosophers, would confront each other because they have different orientations, or they have different positions, or they have different understandings or justifications, uh, for example, during the modern era, there's the question about knowledge. What is knowledge? What is the basis of knowledge? Well, if one will only say, well, knowledge is based on reason, then fine. But there's always the other side. Well, it cannot just be based on reason because we have the senses. So at this moment, because of this crisis, become, the, the discussion, the debate on this problem become more intense. Okay? Now, today, in contemporary period, we are not talking about knowledge, we are talking about the human person in its condition. And because of the different ideologies, because of the different philosophies, the discussion becomes more intense. Okay, because of this moment, what he calls the great crisis and confrontation. So, the problem of the subjectivity of man is a subject of many sided interest because, again, there are many interpretations, there are many ideologies trying to interpret what man is or what is subjectivity. The divergent tendencies with their differing cognitive assumptions and orientations have given the problem of subjectivity diametrically opposed form and meaning. Meaning, at some, some philosophers will say subjectivity is this, some philosophers say subjectivity is this. And I think I have already touched on this topic about different philosophies figuring or offering their interpretation of what subjectivity is. From Aristotle and Aquinas down to the phenomenologists and the sciences. But we are more specific, we are now more specific here. So he said, today more than ever, before we feel the need and also see a great possibility of objectifying the problem of the subjectivity of the human person. So here he tries to trace down the subjectivity, the, the debate about the subjectivity of the person in Western thought. Right. So, the old antinomies that arose in the area of theory of knowledge, he was referring to the theory of knowledge way back the modern era between the rationalists and the empiricists, and form a seemingly inviolable demarcation between basic orientations in philosophy seem to have been set aside and ignored in contemporary thought. So it's referring to, well, if the rationalists and empirists were talking about that, and then of course, here comes Mr. Kant trying to put together the, the two why comes, you know, synthesizing. But for you, it seems that that is no longer the concern of contemporary philosophers. If, if the problem of knowledge has been the concern of modern philosophers until Kant and Hegel in contemporary philosophy, that is no longer the, that is no longer the, the thing. But there remains a demarcation. There's always the demarcation between one camp and another camp. Okay. So the oppositions between subjectivism against objectivism Idealism as against realism are encouraged discouraging discussions on human subjectivity for fear that this could lead to subjectivism. How again it, it could lead to subjectivism, it could lead to say that we are just expressing our own personal preferences. Okay, we are just expressing our own biases. Our so we we cannot see the person or the human person or subjectivity objectively. 
All right? So, this fear creates an unfavorable climate for the study of the subjectivity of man. And this fear is justified by the idealistic overtones of the analysis based on pure consciousness. Okay? So again, I already mentioned how Vitiwa was critical of the idealistic tendency of Husserl when he posits the idea of pure consciousness. Okay? He said, because of this demarcation, because of, you know, opposition between objectivism and subjectivism, between this and that, people don't want to talk about it. Okay? But for fear that, this will only lead to subjectivism. And that fear of subjectivism, according to my is justified with the, the idea of pure consciousness or pure subjectivity that Husserl advanced in his in this philosophy. So this issue about pure consciousness for the strengthens the line of demarcation in philosophy in the opposition between the objective and subjective understanding or view of the human being. There is the objective understanding and there is also the subjective understanding. And that puts a demarcation. So for Medea, he feels like it's difficult to come up with, you know, if you do this or you go on one side, then you fear, you know, of, of, of losing the other side. So for, for him, it's, there is always that the demarcation that you stay in your, in your side, I'm here, and your opponent is there. Okay? There is always the objective understanding of man, and there is also the subjective understanding of man. Okay. So there emerges two contrasting conceptions of man based on this opposition. The objective understanding which anchored on ontology that's later on you will identify that as carried on by St. Thomas and the subjective interpretation or the realistic interpretation based on pure consciousness. Based on the consciousness, on the idea of consciousness of Husserl. Okay, so there is the objective ontological and there is the subjective ideological or phenomenological. By phenomenology we mean Husserl. Okay. So the objective conception is based on the ontological conception of man as being and the subjective or the subjectivistic conception of man simply cut off entirely from the ontological reality of the subject. So there is the idealistic. Okay? There is the objective, ontological, and there is the subjectivistic. Okay. As a consequence, a fixed line of demarcation in opposition between the objective or the objectivistic conception and the subjective or subjectivistic conception of man has been established. It's referring here that was so, so the subjectivistic, the phenomenological, are very are critical of the ontological. Okay, and of course, if you are on the ontological side, you are also critical of the subjectivistic. So, for Boitiwa, he feels like there is a demarcation between two. But of course, if you go in, we know already that he was able to put together because he was influenced. He, he carried on with the tradition of Saint Thomas, ontological and objective, and rely on Scheller's phenomenology to show or to reveal the subjective uh, aspect of man. Okay? But that's how he analyzed the problem. Okay? That's, his, that's the analysis of the of, of, Uitiwa, of the problem of subjectivity. Because of this demarcation, because of these traditions, there is now that demarcation between these two interpretations. But according to him, that such demarcation is breaking down, and he ascribes such breakdown to the method itself of phenomenology. Okay, so why the phenomenology, by way of Husserl, somehow contributed to the demarcation? Somehow, phenomenology, the method of phenomenology, is the one that is breaking down the demarcation on the wall between the two. 
So by going back to human experience, we are liberated from pure consciousness because if we go back to our original experience, there's no such pure consciousness that we can talk about because consciousness is a part of man himself. It's an essential part. Okay? Still part. It's not a separate entity separate from the human person. And we discover that, we understand that because of phenomenology, the method of phenomenology itself. So, we are introduced now to the whole concreteness of human existence of man, and that is to the reality of the conscious subject. Subject, but that subject is conscious, and consciousness is just part of the subject, which is man himself. Okay? So that's how he analyzed the problem of subjectivity. Now let's go to what will be his proposal to address this problem of subjectivity. And of course, his response is personalism. But what kind of personalism? So the response of Uitiwa to the problem of human person is a different kind of orientation, an attitude that is focused on the value and dignity of the human person. Voitiwa acknowledges the influence of his formation, again, in the area of personalism, in his appreciation of the uniqueness of the human person. So again, he writes here, uh, you see there where, let's uh, I got that. My formation within the cultural horizon of personalism also gave me a deeper awareness of how its human person, or its individual, is a unique person. So here he tries to avoid the pitfalls of any theoretical conception of the human person and clarifies that personalism is not primarily a theory of the person or a theoretical science of the person. So he's not just theorizing. Okay? For him, its meaning is largely practical and ethical. It is concerned with the person as a subject and an object of activity as a subject of rights, etc., etc., etc. So the point is, of course, he is theorizing here, but the main goal is not just to theorize, but to promote, advance the idea of, or a kind of personalism that respects the dignity of the human person. Okay. So well, some philosopher will just tell us about the dignity, but I think with you, um, uh, he puts it in a, a different level. I mean, he's not just thinking about the human person. The end point is not really just to understand the human person, but to, to, to appreciate, to defend, to preserve the dignity of the human, of the human person. So he's, he's not just doing a kind of a philosophical analysis in order to establish a kind of metaphysics, but he, he, you know, he, re he advances it in, by saying that I'm not, this is just a, a kind of theory of the human person. The end goal is to promote, to defend, to preserve the dignity of the human person. Okay? So while the basis is ontology, the end point is not just ontology. It is practical and ethical and ontological. Okay? I think this, uh, the, the, uh, been, I've been talking about that because some, sometimes uh, I don't want you to get the impression that Yes, he's a philosopher, he's just philosophizing, he's just theorizing. But he's different from, from other philosophers, in this sense, because the end goal is not just to understand the other person, but to defend his dignity. And why defend his dignity? Well, you can go back to it again to the experiences. Okay? <clears throat> so, his philosophy, again, is based on his personal, personal experiences. All right, so although his, this personalism of Oitiwa is largely based on theological personalism of Thomas Aquinas, we will later know the Thomistic personalism, he also draws certain insights from the phenomenology of Max Scheller. This is actually how he does it, combines the Thomistic or St. Thomas ontology and Marx uh, <coughs> phenomenology. Arguably, his personalism is a good blend or harmonious synthesis of Thomism, 
and Chilean phenomenology. Okay? <clears throat> so what is this Thomistic personalism? Boitiva's personalism is both based on the personalism of St. Thomas and the personalism of Max Schaeffer. Right. So let's go to the first, the first, first, to the influence of Thomas. The Thomistic and theological personalism is primarily based on the concept of the person as it is applied to the Trinity and Incarnation. We have the three persons. The Trinitarian person can be applied to the human person by analogy. Okay. Of course, uh, well, St. Thomas explains being by way of analogy. Okay. And analogy by proportion and analogy by attribution. We, we attribute, for example, being to different beings because God is a being, we are being. Being is anything that exists, God exists, we exist, but we can, our being cannot be equal to God. Our being is a, is a being by way of participation, we participate in the being of God. So, it cannot be the same. We are being only by participation or by analogy. Right? So, in, in the same manner that we are the, the Trinity, God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are persons, but we are not persons in the same sense. Okay? We only participate in the being persons. Okay? So our being person is not identical to the being person of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, you know that, of course. Following the thoughts of St. Thomas on this matter, Boidiva finds, whatever is the true perfection in the created world must be found in the highest degree in God. And so, the person too, which signifies the highest perfection in the world of creatures, must be realized in an incomparably more perfect degree in God. But he further asserts the theistic position that in the created world, the person is the highest perfection. The person is a perfection, no? the highest perfect being, at least in the created world. Okay? So you have God, and then angels, and then you have the corporeal world, and in the corporeal world, the highest perfect being is the human person, or man. Uh, those of you who are uh, well versed on St. Thomas, you will have, you, you understand that. Huh? And I would suppose that you are all experts or knowledgeable of, of St. Thomas. Okay? So St. Thomas follows the Boethian definition of person as person as a rational nature or individual substance of a rational nature. An individual substance of a rational nature. A substance, individual, because what individuates man? What individuates the human, the, the person, or the human being? What is the principle of individuality? Matter, the body. The person is a substance with a body. But how do you differentiate the person from other corporeal beings, from other beings with a body? A rationality. And that's the definition. Person is a rational nature, an individual substance of a rational nature. So he follows St. Thomas along, along that line. So according to this view, a rational nature does not possess its own existence or subsistence, as a nature, it subsists in a person. Okay? Subsists in a person. So there is no 
rational nature that subsists in itself. It must subsist in a person. So you don't you don't see a rational nature walking around. You see a person walking around, a being walking around, and that being who walks around has reason. And you don't see a reason walking around. Reason must subsist in something. And that something, that being is that one, the person. Okay? So the person then is a subsistent subject of existence and action. Subsistent subject. Okay? I don't know if that is not redundant. Subsistent subject. When you think of a subject that is not subsistent, Can you think of a subject that is not consistent? Because a subject is uh, in the degree that it's a substance, therefore it subsists. I must be wrong. I mean, it's, it's redundant. No, a person is a subsistent. There must be an explanation to that. No? A subsistent subject <coughs> or a subject that's overkill. Huh? The subject has to be subsistent. Without subsistence, a subject is not a subject. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 the point is that as a subject, you are already subsistent. So you, you, you cannot, a, a human, human. I think it's just for emphasis. Anyway. <laughs> An individual substance of... Okay. Alright, so subject of existence and action. Okay. So there is the essence and the, the operation. So in the created world, the human person is objectively the most perfect being and such perfection is the result of the rational in the spiritual nature which subsists in the person, which exists in the person. Okay, so what, what differentiates us from the other beings is because of our rationality. But the origin of that rationality is our spirituality. And the origin of our spirituality is the fact that we are created by God, the, the Spirit. Okay. Any question? Th those of you who are familiar with St. Thomas, you, it's okay. You, you, you get that. So reason and freedom are the two properties concretized in the person. You have, of course, freedom, the uh, reason, the intellect, and and freedom. If you trace the origin of that freedom, you can trace it back to the will. Freedom as determination of self-determination to the will. So the person, therefore, is always a rational and free, concrete being, capable of all those activities that reason and freedom alone make possible. It is the rational soul that gives man his spiritual capacities or faculties of intelligence and will and makes him a person. Because all these qualities or capacities that we have based on our rational soul are capacities that we can also find in the perfect person, in the Trinity. Okay. However, man is not just a being composed of a soul. Man is composed of both the spiritual and corporeal. The spirit and the body. So you go back to the theory of a highly morphism of St. Thomas. Which I'm very sure you are all familiar with. With. Okay. Well, 
So, which explains this union of the body and spirit through highly morphic analysis. Highly meaning matter and morphic meaning form. The soul is the form while the body is matter. And like any other highly morphic creature, there is a substantial union between matter and form or the body and the soul. So, this is just sort of a review of your domestic philosophy. Anybody here who, who did not take any course on domestic philosophy? So we can explain this. Otherwise, if you are all familiar with that, then I will go to the next. Okay. Fine. So let's move on to this. I will uh, I will skip this part, then move to the next. See, we are taking so much time here. All right, so let's go to the unique and complex composition of the human person. So for we do what, the relationship between the body and the soul is of basic importance for understanding the wholeness or the whole uniqueness of the human person, as well as for explaining the whole structure of the human person. Both the body and the spirit have their respective powers or capacities, the soul operates through the mediation of the rational faculties, and the two highest are reason through the intellect and rational volition through the will. So this is again basic holistic psychology. Okay. So there is the faculty of the intellect, these are the rational faculties. And through the faculty of reason, we are able to understand, we are able to know. And through the faculty of the will, we are able to exercise our volition. We are able to choose and decide. There is a faculty of decision and choice. So, it is through reason and will that the spirituality of man is actualized and through which man realizes himself. And based on the activities of reason and will, the whole psychological and moral personality takes shape. So as the substantial form of the body, aside from the spiritual powers, the soul has powers or faculties that are intrinsically dependent on the body. And now he's referring here to the sense faculties. And to the appetitive faculties, namely the emotions. So we need, for example, we need the sense of, or this, the sense organs for our senses to operate. Okay? And to some extent, uh, the emotions are also dependent on our sense faculties. So these faculties, since they belong to the concrete human being, are also found in the person and therefore contribute to the shaping of the psychological and moral personality. Okay? So all the faculties of the human soul work to perfect the human being, hence they contribute to the development of the human person. So here, we is trying to uh, integrate all the faculties, or the faculties of man. So starting from the rational faculty down to the lower faculties. So, of course, uh, he's showing that although the constitution of the human person is so complex, at the same time it is integrated. Integrated because of the rational and spiritual nature of man. So this complex constitution of the human person is composed of the material and spiritual aspects makes him unique from all other entities in the world. Because while other entities, like for example the animals, have also the same constitution, they don't have the rational faculties to integrate this, integrate everything. Okay? The, the animals can only go as high as the sensitive faculties. They don't have the, the rational faculties because they don't have the spiritual nature. Of course, Aristotle would also say that the animals have their soul, the psyche, 
Okay? But of course, you know, the classification of different substances and forms, from the vegetative to the sensation and to the rational. Okay? So, fine, no question about that. So, <clears throat> here, because of this nature, the human person is also a subject. As a subject, he is an entity that exists and acts in a certain way. He exists as an object that is an objective somebody. An objective somebody. So, objective in the sense that he has his own specific constitution, he has his own nature, but he's also at the same time a somebody. He's not just, I think the use of the term there is very important, somebody, because somebody refers to a person. You don't refer to object as somebody. As an object, man is somebody, and this sets him apart from every other entity in the visible world, which as an object is always only something. All right. Now, uh, the, the use of the terms can be attributed to the influence of many of the, of the stencilists and the terminologists. Because that's the term used by a phenomenologist and referring to person as somebody to differentiate the person from object, which they call simply as something, or what Buber would call an it. Somebody is a doubt, okay? And the object is just an it. Okay. So, for Boitiwa, it's not enough to define man just as an individual of this species homo. The term person has been coined to signify that man cannot be entirely contained with the concept of individual member of the species. There is a particular richness and perfection in the manner of his being that can only be brought out by the use of the term person. I think this is where we feel a different say St. Thomas from Aristotle. Because why Aristotle would simply define man as a rational animal and even uh, distance himself from Boethius, although he followed the Boethian definition of person as individual substance of a rational nature. It's precisely because of the term person which he traced back to the origin of God that Aristotle, or that uh, St. Thomas, differentiates himself from Aristotle. Okay. So, in fact, Boitiwa would call this definition of man as a rational animal, as a kind of cosmological reduction. By cosmological reduction, because man is reduced to the level of the cosmos, meaning to the level of the Animals. So by defining man as a rational animal, Aristotle reduces man to the level of the animals. Well, there is the uh, sort of an icing of being rational. But according to, to Manuel Lee, pinakamagandang hayop sa balat ng lupa, pero hayop pa rin. So you define man as a rational animal, he may be the, the most perfect, the highest form of animal in the world, but still an animal. Okay. So for Boitiwa, following again this tradition of existentialism, it's not enough to simply define man as a rational animal. Because he is a person, he is a somebody. Of course, the other existentialists would also refer to man as person. But why person? The origin of the term person, you can trace that back to the medieval usage of the person. And that person, that idea of person can be traced back to Aquinas and even Augustine. 
but that that person is a person. The the reference of that person is the person of God. So you see, in contemporary Islamism and terminology, they also use the word person, but they don't trace the origin of the notion of person to the medieval or to, to Aquinas and to Augustine. Buitiwa does because he is rooted in the Thomistic medieval tradition. That's one difference between Buitiwa and the other existentialists. No other existentialists would tell us that man is a, is a person because it's an English is like it's a God. Well, Kant would say, well, respect the person because but respect the person because he is an end, not a means. But that's the farthest that can can go into substantiating his claim about the dignity of the human person. Okay. Actually, that's it's not even a whole. It's not even a uh, a complete discussion on the dignity of the human person because that mention of the dignity of the human person of Kant is just one of the expressions of the categorical imperative. That's the second expression of the categorical imperative. We were talking about categorical imperative. And one expression of the categorical imperative is that you treat the person whether in another or in yourself not as a means but as an end. So, why? No explanation. Because that's the law, because that's the moral law says. Okay? So, and we have to follow the moral law unconditionally. That's why it's a categorical imperative. Ask why? No. Of course, when you ask with you why, then you, he will tell you, you can trace that back to Aquinas and to, to Augustine. Alright, so the most obvious and basic reason for this is the ability to reason, which cannot be said of other entities in the world. Man is a rational being, and this differentiates him from the whole world of objective entities. And this is man's distinctive character as a person. He is distinguished from all other entities, even from the most advanced animal, because of his specific inner self, and inner life that is characteristic only of person. So the inner life there would be again the subjectivity. Right? Again, that's it's not only Aquinas or it's not only Boitiwa who says that. And the other philosophers, the other essentialists also says that about the inner uh, uh, this inner character no? of the person, the inner self, the inner life characteristic of the person. So it is only man whose cognition and desire is stamped with his spiritual character. Again, that spiritual character is unique to Aquinas because of his influence. You will not find that to other existentialist philosophers about the spiritual. Tell that to, to Nietzsche and he will not accept the idea that man has that spiritual, you know, Okay. In fact, it's by denying the spiritual that we become that we affirm ourselves. All right. So this spiritual character is fundamental in the formation of a genuine interior or inner life. So again, that's a different idea of Boitiwa, different from the other existentialists and the other phenomenologists. About the, well, there is the inner life, but that inner life for Boitiwa is a spiritual, a spiritual life. Okay. okay? So far, okay? No questions? Okay. So, because of this spiritual life, which is the basis of his rationality, and because of his inner being, and in dear life, per man is a person and therefore distinct from all other entities. But while these characteristics set him apart from all entities, it is also because of this that he can involve and relate himself with the world of objective entities. Because of his spirituality, because of his inner life, 
It's not only that man can relate with himself, he can also relate with the outside world. So for Boitiwa, the, the inner life, the subjectivity of man, is the basis for his intersubjective relation. That's where you draw the connection between the subjective and the intersubjective. Of course, later on, Boitiwa would say, we, we can, we don't only act, we act together with others. Okay? There is, there is already, when we are born, there is already the social world. There is already the intersubjective world. But the question is, what allows us, or enables us, to interact, to relate with the outside world? It's our inner, it's our interior life. It's our interiority. It's our spiritual life. But of course, if you only have the inner, the inner life, without the body, you, you still need the body because it's also the body that facilitates our connection or relationship with the external world. Even if you have the inner life, if you don't have the body, you know, how can that be possible? Okay? So for Goitiwa, it's very important that we emphasize both the interior or spiritual life and the somatic or the somatic aspect of our personality. That's why I said, well, it's a complex constitution of man, but the same. And because of that complexity, it is unique. Right? So he elucidates here, a person is an objective entity which as a definite subject has the closest contact with the whole, with the external world, and is most intimately involved with it, precisely because of its inwardness, its interior life. Of course, some, some other philosophers would say that the, the inner life is just within. No? But for Vitiwa, it's the interior life that allows us to relate, to connect with the outside world. But the medium of that connection would be the body, would be the soma. Okay. All right. So, how many, how many pages do I have here? Oh my God, 195. I'm only on page 38. Anyway. Sir. Yes. I, I don't know if I heard everything, but uh, when you say <clears throat> the other, and the external world, would this refer only to other human uh, beings or the include, would this include the environment and uh, other uh, entities? It includes the environment and the other entities. Okay. But of course, the, the relationship between man and a fellow man is richer than his relationship with the environment and the other Entities. I've read a very interesting you know, article by, uh, I think it's Ernest Martin, uh, in fact, of the Arrogance of Man, uh -huh. where in, uh, it, it's something like this, man, the overemphasis of man's superiority over other entities okay, might okay. be the reason also why we abuse and we seem to not care <laughs> about the other members of the, of the world, something like that. Yeah, in ethics, you call that anthropocentrism. Yes. That what is the right of man to allocate for himself this dominant position when, in fact, he's just one of the. You know, I mean, of course, the reason for that, for, for the anthropocentric, is that we have reason. But of course, the other ethicists would be. I, I forgot the. Uh, well, it's my lecture in lecture in uh, in special ethics. I forgot. Ecology. Uh, yeah, ecology. There are many positions in in. I think that's deep ecology. Yeah, there are different positions, and one of the positions is this: anthropocentrism, where man assigns to himself 
this dominant position. And that will be the basis why, because man thinks that he is the, 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 the center, the powerful, and therefore he can dominate all the other beings in the world. Therefore he can, you know, he can, he can manipulate, he can control. So that, that's, that's one question. But how does this relate here? Well, we are coming from a perspective where of course, the other, the other deep ecologists will not accept what is in the Bible, okay? But uh, Christians, or those who believe in the, in the scriptures, will say that, well, we were created, or we, will, we were created by God, and we were commanded to be stewards. To subdue the earth. To subdue the earth, but, well, that's the biblical, that's the biblical term, but I think, some fellows interpret it, are now interpreting it as a kind of stewardship. Okay? But again, but the deep cause of again person, she looks at the same thing, call him when he is the word nami, or non-environment. It will also be man appropriating for himself that position. That's anthropocentrism. Okay, but here, if you if you got to use with me what to explain that, well. Because it's coming from this perspective. <coughs> so, really, man, because of that reason, well, he can be the dominant, he can be, well, he can be the king of God's creation. But of course, again, if you don't follow that, the creationism, that idea of creation, that we, which you find in the scriptures, then you can always challenge that. In that article, I suppose it's a good challenge to that position. But it's, it's good in the sense that it can soften our position. Okay. It can soften our stance as to how us being the stewards of the world. And the more that we can be, we have to be more, uh, what do you call this? Responsible. We, can, we have to be more responsible. And I think the in the cyclical nature of, of Francis Laudato Si, uh, it strikes a, a hard, you know, hard note on this, that we have to be more, res more responsible, you know, ecology, uh, integral, integral of ecology. But again, that interior ecology thing will always put man at the center, at the center, not just at the center, the, and the, and the, and the order, the fact order is always the alpha. And that is actually what is being questioned by this other, by this other emphasis. Okay? That central role, the dominant role of man. I mean, of course, there are many papers and many arguments for their position. Uh, one, one picture that I saw, I, I don't know if it's a picture, but I, I think it's an illustration. Illustration of, the, of how responsible man is as compared to how animals are responsible. You, you, when man goes to the forest, he destroys the forest. But when an, the animals who reside in the forest, preserves the forest. Okay? So the animals residing in the forest, they preserve. Man, when he goes to the forest, he leaves his trash, his garbage. So who is responsible, man or the animals? So of course, these are different, you know, different discourses, different uh, orientations about <coughs> relationship between man and uh, in the world, or man in the environment. Yes. Before we, before we enter the second topic, the isolation of the external world. So I, I, I really wonder, wonder about why you call it the spiritual nature of man separates himself or distinguishes himself from the rest, and at the same time opens himself to the world. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, this spiritual nature of man uh, refers, uh, according to Thomas, uh, 
a rational nature, the ability to recognize one's own end, and the ability to carry himself or herself towards that and yeah. recognize by himself. Uh, and also you suddenly, not suddenly, I see uh, another term added into this. You added another term like interiority. Yeah. What is this interiority? Uh, oh, okay. Yes. But we've been talking about the interiority. <coughs> the interiority is the inner life, our subjectivity, our thoughts, our, you know, our wishes, but the reason why we have this interior, the, 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 the character, the quality of this interiority is probably or something that is spiritual. Yes. Uh, is interiority different from um, the reason will? Um, or is it some, something that grows from the will and reason? Like I have wishes, it's my will. Thinking of something I really that's my wish. <coughs> that's part of your interiority. Your will and your reason is part of your inner life. Yep, yep. See, let, let's put it this way. So, we have both a physical and a spiritual nature. Okay? So, we have the body and the spirit. Because of our spirit, we have this inner life. Because of our spiritual nature, we can think, we can wish, we have aspirations, we have intentions, etc., etc., etc. Right? But within this, this inner spiritual inner life, there are two fundamental faculties or capacities: the capacity to reason, that's the intellect, and the capacity to choose or to will. That's the faculty of the will. So part of the inner the spiritual is the is the rational. Of course, we, we always say we always equate the spiritual with the rational because what that's what really defines our spiritual inner nature that we are because we are rational. We can have these thoughts, we can have these these intentions, etc., etc. So it's it's not separate. The, the, the rational is not a, it's not separate from our inner life or our spiritual life. It's a component, it's a capacity of our inner or spiritual life. Uh, uh, because when I read this on uh, the interiority of, of a person, yeah. uh, immediately seems, uh, it seems to me that this interiority uh, can be somehow Explained by this uh, reason and will, mm -hmm. because uh, somehow we grow from it. Or uh, because I uh, suddenly, through your explanation, I realize somehow uh, it's like this reason and will is uh, is something that grows from this inheritance. Because uh, what is inherent is the spiritual nature of the reason and will seems the only faculty. Okay. Well, you can say it, it grows, but I think it, it, it does grow not in the sense that it's not there and then it grows. Yeah. It's already there. Yeah. I mean, we only it's precisely because of our spiritual nature, when we were conceived, of course, we have we have our explanation as to the conception. I mean, um, our parents being the co-creator of God because they 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 contributed the physical aspect and then God infuse the, the, the spiritual but because of that spiritual nature there is already the 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 rational and the volitional meaning reason and will but it grows in the sense that it develops further as the person matures as the person develops okay? so it's just it's not, it does not grow that there's not there is it's absent and then it grows it's already there but as the person matures through his experiences, then the the inner, the spiritual, including the rational and the volitional, grows with it. Or develops or matures with it. Okay. So 
not work how they understand the interiority as something that is uh, not reserved, that has been stored from memory, experience, and everything. Well, in that sense, if you interpret interiority in that sense, yes, it, it really grows through our experiences, through our memories, etc., etc. And that becomes the interior or interiority. Yeah, that's part of the interiority, but you cannot, you cannot. But in something, uh, it, then it becomes some, some kind of lingering of what reason and will uh, has function. Or, or, like, that's my will before, and uh, uh, it has been there for so long that I am uh, even have no need to become conscious of it. Uh, it, it is so interior to me that uh, it goes up so naturally that it's even. There's no need for him to win it, actually. Uh, ah, okay, I, I think, I think <coughs> now we have a different understanding of the, of the will and, and the, the, the way you understand the will. Uh, yes, it, it's also correct to say, or to interpret the will the way you interpret it, that it can, you know, uh, you don't have to will it, it, can, it just comes out naturally. So that's one way of interpreting the will. But we are interpreting, as a faculty, we are interpreting the, the will as a capacity to choose, as a capacity to desire, as a capacity to make decisions. Okay. Of course, there are some things in us that have grown so naturally that you don't have to will it. Yeah, but if you go in the place the very origin of these experiences, the very reason why these experiences make sense to us is because of our internal faculties, of our rational faculties. Who will process all this? Or what will process all this? Yes. It so should be the <coughs> rational faculty. And quite as identifies the two rational faculties as intellect and will. Okay? All right. Anybody who can explain that? Yes? So in other words, the interior of man is the basis. We can say that it's the basis and the source of his subjectivity. Yes. Yes. And then of course, if, just to connect this to our previous discussion about personal subjectivity and ontological subjectivity, I think we can, we can put it this way. So there is the ontological subjectivity that is common to all. And that subjectivity, we can probably include that subjectivity is the inner, the interior, interior life, the inner life. And part of that is our capacity to reason and to will. But as we grow, we develop our own inner life. We develop based on our own personal experiences based on our own wishes and desires, etc., etc., and that's when the personal subjectivity emerges out of our own personal experiences. I think that's what we create, you know, that personal subjectivity, <coughs> the individual subjectivity. But there cannot be an individual personal subjectivity if in the first place there is no on the, the subject ontologically, I mean, as a subject. And I, I mentioned last time that how we can explain that for Sartre, existence precedes essence. Because he's talking of individual essence that we create after we exist. But prior to that existence, there is already the rational nature, the metaphysical subjectivity that we are talking about. Okay? Yes? Questions? Yes. Uh, just to add to the discussion. I think uh, what he was using of interiority here or internal life uh, is, is, a, is a term which we can find in like, psychology, yeah. phenomenology. Because this term, interior life, interiority, inner life, can be found. It's not a constant term. Yeah. But, uh, I would say that this interiority is a blanket term to explain the, uh, the things that happen 
the inside of not the physical inside of the person, but uh, the faculty, the two faculties, uh, reason, intellect, and will, emotions, etc., as uh, contrast to the exterior of the human person, is action, is body and presence, etc. Yes. Yeah, that's, I think that's a better way of. of and it's a simpler way of saying it, that the, the, the interior is contrasted to the exterior, what we see. And the interior is what we don't, what we don't really see. So it's a blunt term, everything that happens inside of the human person. And that will include the emotions, the wishes, reasons, the will, etc., etc. But in the order, for the people, finds reason and will are the highest of this. Because they are the ones that make sense. Everything that happened inside. No. Uh, or can we understand interiority as the spiritual life, uh, intellect, and will, as in the faculty of this kind of life? Okay. Uh, if, uh, then this life becomes the source energy or everything that we, uh, cannot be explained simply by reasoning or being. Mm -hmm. There really is something that the uh, Oh, yeah. But the, 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 I think the, the difficulty in understanding this is that we are putting together concepts that belong to different fields. I mean, the spiritual thing, especially when we, if we follow Aquinas, is a theological, it's a theological concept that we appropriate to philosophy. And then you have interiority coming from a different field and then integrated into the philosophy of Aquinas. So, <coughs> into the philosophy of Ithiwa. So, it really, if you are not so familiar with the terms, then it really become, becomes very complicated. Because we are putting together concepts from, from different disciplines, like in theology and ecology. And because uh, from the side of Aquinas, it seems that what you are talking about interiority can be, let's say, explained by, by reason of will, mm -hmm. either as a lingering of the past the action of the will or reason, or as a forwarded, uh, let's say, to be happened as a desire that comes from the being. Mm -hmm. And this interiority, uh, from his side, it seems can be, can be, let's say, reduced to this faculty, <coughs> or the experience of this faculty. Uh, that's why I, I find it a little <laughs> difficult to, to, get, to grasp what is this interiority. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can just understand interiority from the psychological, you know? anything that happens inside man. That includes his emotions. Of course, emotion has external manifestation, but you have the emotions, the wishes, the thoughts, the ideas, the concepts. Either these thoughts, concepts, happen in the past or will happen in the future. As long as they are inside man, that's, that defines the interiority of man, the inner life. Now, you add the component of theology, and Vaitiwa will say that inner life has a spiritual nature. Uh, because uh, it seems that uh, uh, John Paul is identifying this interiority as the subjectivity or the personal subjectivity. Yes. And well, whereas the ontological subjectivity comes from a mm -hmm. uh, Since he is fusing something. Uh, it, it's, it's not it seems. He, he, he is fusing the two. Yet, from uh, a side, it's, it seems there's something <laughs> that is really fused into. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's my. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, Aquinas can no longer object. <laughs> well, maybe they, they are discussing in heaven. <laughs> you want to join this discussion? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to join the discussion, but two things will happen. Two things must happen. If you die, and you live a good life. Even if you die, you don't live a good life. No way. You will be converted with somebody down there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, 
So the contact and relation of the person with everything in the external world is not purely based on the physical or the sensual. As a spiritual subject, man establishes contact with all other entities through his inner self. I think I already mentioned that. So definitely man's contact with the outside world starts with the physical, especially the body, or the natural, and the sensitive or sensual because he has a body which is his means through which he communicates with the outside world. But the impressions and messages that he receives are received and processed by his internal faculties. So again, what I said is, it's coming from the inside, and then by means of the body, we're able to connect with the world, but we are going to receive the messages from the outside, man, the environment, etc. We receive that through our senses, and then we process that. So it's the, it's the inner life, I mean, again, the reason in the world that makes sense out of these different messages. Well, the other animals can receive those messages. They may also process, but if they will not be able to process the way we, we process. I mean, you ask me questions and then I process your questions. Can an animal have a discussion like this? What? Rational. Oh yes, the rational animal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, in the, they are always processed by the external or internal faculties. So as persons, we do not just react to impressions outside of us or to the messages from the external world in a spontaneous or purely mechanical manner, that's for the animals. We react according to our spiritual and rational nature. And this nature includes the power of reason and self-determination, which is based on the intellect and the will. All right, I will come to the last topic of my discussion for tonight. And also then, I think, uh, all right. So, yeah, I will, will, I will discuss you early tonight. Oh, you don't like that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> So man as sui juris, the person because of his reason and will is a sui juris. He is his own master and therefore cannot be determined by external ex impressions and messages from the external world. So while we receive the impressions coming from the outside, we process those information. While we are affected by the messages or impressions, we are the ones who process them, and therefore, we are the ones who determine how they are going to affect us. Of course, there are instances when we allow ourselves to be affected by external conditions, like for example, if the room is very cold, and you're already very tired, you fall asleep. So you allow the external environment to affect you, all right? But just the same, it does not mean that we are not masters of ourselves, it's simply that Sometimes we lower our guards and we allow external things to, to affect us. Okay? So every person therefore exists for his own sake in the sense that he belongs to himself and can never be the property of another unless he allows himself to be the property of another. But it does not mean that you are no longer a master of yourself because by allowing yourself to be affected by other people, it's still you who is allowing himself to be affected by other people. Further, his personality is altary incommunicabilis. He cannot be transferred to anybody else. So our interior, the way we feel, well, probably some people can sympathize with us, can also feel the way we feel, but not exactly the way we feel. We can, all, we can never transfer our self, our interiority to others. No? We all have the capacity to love, but we love differently. Okay? <laughs> so, we may have the same experiences, but our lived experiences are different. Okay? So, that's the, uh, it can't be transferred. It can't. Nobody can win for you, or nobody can like for you, nobody can decide for you, unless you allow other people to decide for you, but it's still you who allow other people to decide for you. Okay? You can allow your mother to dictate your vocation, or your father to dictate your vocation, 
but it will still be you who allow other people to, to dictate on you, right? So, uh, the human person is not just a master of himself, he's at the same time a unique and unrepeatable entity. Okay? A unique and unrepeatable entity. And that's, this is the reason why Waitiwa criticizes this cosmological reduction of Aristotle. Why? Because nobody can, nobody can replace us. Okay? Up Yes, granted that we have the same rational nature, but the way we express and manifest our rationality is different from the way other people express their own rationality. Okay? So although this characteristic can also be said of other entities, man's inalienability is intrinsic to the person's inner life because of his free will and the power of self-determination. Nobody can decide for us, nobody can want for us, and nobody can substitute his will for us again unless we allow other people to <laughs> to win for us but in that sense in that case it's still us who allow other people to win for us yes sorry sorry no ah, sorry uh, because this is about the relation of man to the external world yes. so i'm um, just thinking uh, the self-determination here of man it's very personal and very concrete to him. Right? Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, how do we limit this self-determination with regards to other external persons uh, in a sense that it does not offend them? Not necessarily, okay, so to put some colors to it. yung so so whatever. Yung sabi niya babae siya, he says he's a woman, but he is not. Really? His self-determination or his, his, his oh. person is technically, pardon me with the word, is assaulting the others in a sense. Uh -huh. I mean, this is a human person, full dignity, full everything, self-determined. However, in a sense, it is an assault to other individuals or persons outside of him in that sense where his self-determination is offensive actually to some although you have said we can sympathize some per, some, per, well, some person can sympathize to, to him or her whatever he wants him to be called uh, but there's something wrong with that self-determination it is that's a very difficult question <laughs> Uh, how how do I explain this? It's still a self-determined act because it's it's uh, it's coming from his will, his or her will. Okay. Uh, but how about if it affects morality, okay, or or the sensibilities of other people, right? Uh, I think. Oh, we need to relate uh, this dimension to our uh, truth because here, just like freedom, and freedom is rooted in uh, truth. I think. To the truth? Yes. Because this is very uh, subjective, I think. So I, I agree with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, agree with, I, I'm just, I agree with your point. I, I agree with this point. I'm just thinking of how to connect, you know, how to. Perhaps there's a limit for our self-determination in regards to truth. There's yes, yes, yes. Have to yeah, right, right, right. I get, I get it. So self-determination is a personal subjective expression, okay? But the will must also be guided by reason. And I think I already mentioned that the, the role in the introduction that there should be the element of truthfulness. Okay? That you cannot just win anything or you can just follow your will without the guidance of, of reason. So it, it's reason that will tell us what should be the proper or you know, the right or the true way to follow. Okay? And of course, uh, applying this to, the, to this issue about gender, the thing is that for my view, it's very clear, especially in, in, in the theology of the body. 
you are referring to the the original what's this? Yeah, the, the the original position of man and woman from the moment of creation. Okay, that man, that God created man in his own image and likeness, male and female. And when we talk about matrimony or when God instituted marriage, <coughs> marriage is between not just between two individuals. This he, he, he God did not say or marriage was not instituted as the union between two individuals. It was precisely a union between male and female, not just two individuals. But of course, this this new discourse now, they are trying to redefine marriage by saying that marriage is union between two individuals. That's very dangerous. See, that's that's how you can when you when you change when you change how we define things or concepts or institution, that's become, that becomes very dangerous. And by redefining marriage into union between two individuals, well, you change the whole thing about marriage. Well, come to think of it, what's the root word of matrimony? Matrix, the womb, to take care of the womb. So it's not just, well, to preserve the womb, and you cannot preserve the womb with two males or two females. <laughs> I mean, the womb can function with, if you have the two genders. 